Today I'm going to talk about the most difficult subject in uh, the 1L criminal law course, which is conspiracy. Uh, conspiracy is absolutely essential for you to understand the modern criminal justice system um, because many, if not most, of our crimes uh, involve more than one person. And conspiracies has evolved in most jurisdictions to be the primary tool for dealing with these situations. And it often is supplanted or at least supplemented. Uh, accomplice liability is the tool for prosecutors to get convictions when one or more people are involved in a crime. So to that end, we have a few things that I want to just address at the outset, unique aspects or uh, different aspects about conspiracy that provide some framing, including some things that we don't really read cases on. And then uh, I'm going to delve into the act requirements, which are in many senses the simplest part of the mens rea analysis. Okay, well, the began the chapter with uh, an older essay um, about where the conspiracy doctrine emerged from, its role, um, and what's interesting is the Sayre essay, which is 1922, and you already see that there is concern, uh, despite the long history of conspiracy, about how it's evolving, how it's it's starting to cover more and more conduct as criminal uh, that wouldn't exist before. And yet it's fair to say that since 1922, it's grown far broader. Um, and so even at this point, you had criminal law theorists wondering about uh, the law here and, and is it doing too much? Is it applying in circumstances it shouldn't? And yet, uh, we really see its growth in the latter half of the 20th century. Uh, the federal government implements a, a new uh, type of conspiracy statute in RICO, um, but it's not central to our concern, and none of our cases involved here. Uh, but it sets up some dynamics that were a bit unusual, such as a person being responsible in certain instances when they join a conspiracy for acts that occurred prior to the joining of that conspiracy. Um, there's also a growth in the, the way that we define um, uh, conspiracy such that it becomes more malleable and prosecutors are able to define and argue uh, the shape and scope of the conspiracy in new and different ways. Um, but there's also some, some particular doctrinal issues that it's at least worth noting. Uh, one, for example, that's not uh, focused on our course because it's more procedural is that in conspiracy cases you sometimes see prosecutorial forum shopping. Uh, because venue is proper anywhere an overact and furtherance of a conspiracy is, sometimes at the federal level you'll see uh, decisions being made about where to prosecute conspiracies that are a bit unusual. They're more associated with civil procedure. Um, but there is one doctrine that I didn't think it was worth reading a case uh, that we do at least want to recognize, which is bilateral and unilateral requirements. Um, what do these concern? Well, every conspiracy needs more than one person. But the question we have is, what if uh, the other people who are involved besides the defendant are all police or undercover um, agents in some way, or they're confidential informants that are acting as agents of the police? Does it count as a conspiracy if there's really only one true criminal there? Well, in jurisdictions that have the bilateral requirement, um, the answer is no. It's not a conspiracy unless there's at least two uh, people that are not criminal, or is one case illustrated in Maryland where we had a defendant who uh, had their conspiracy conviction overturned because it turns out the other members of the conspiracy were an undercover officer, a confidential informant, and then somebody who was legally insane, uh, who, who, which is extremely rare, um, who didn't count. Uh, so they, they didn't have two non-insane people that were not working for law enforcement. Uh, that's an extreme uh, instance. Uh, so this affects uh, undercover sting operations. If you're in a jurisdiction that has a bilateral requirement, you need to make sure there's at least two non-criminals involved. A unilateral requirement is really not much requirement at all, right? Obviously, there has to be a defendant who's not criminal, so it's almost like an anti-requirement. So that's you know one distinction that, that emerges, and I will let you know on the exam or something uh, which uh, rule is in play there. Uh, but conspiracy serves two different functions, and this is where things get tricky, right? Because at first, when students see conspiracy, they're like, well, this isn't that different than accomplice liability. Well, one of the ways it's different is it's an inchoate crime, just like attempt, meaning the conspiracies occur before the intended completed crime um, has uh, resulted. So, for example, a conspiracy to commit murder happens when there's an agreement to commit murder and maybe an overt act as well. We'll talk about that soon. 
but you don't actually have to have the murder complete. So in this way, conspiracy is an inchoate crime, uh, and that's one of its two important functions. And then the other is it's a form of making one person responsible for the acts of another through this concept, vicarious liability. So as opposed to derivative liability, a phrase that's often used with accomplice liability, vicarious liability is a label uh, we'll use here. But we'll get to this a bit more in mens rea and, and how one person gets connected to other crimes because it's not going to be through the same aiding and abetting mechanism that we saw in accomplice liability. It's going to be different here in conspiracy. And this is where conspiracy really starts to, to differ and expand its scope beyond that aiding and abetting realm to very different situations. Um, but these are, you know, these two functions, again, you can see and easily imagine your head how it gets there both. But it's the, sometimes when it's using both at the same time, the conspiracy reaches results that might, you know, shock you or worry you in terms of the scope of the criminal justice system. Now, conspiracy can either have one or two act requirements. Um, but the second one is almost not a real one. Uh, so the first is the agreement requirement. And that's where we're going to focus our attention. And I'll get to that in a second. The overt act requirement is very different in the context of conspiracy in most jurisdictions. There are a couple different rules here that we're going to just ignore for our purposes. Um, so the overt act requirement attempt was a big deal, right? In, in the common law attempt, proximity, test could mean somebody is not liable until they're very close, dangerously near the completion of a crime. Even the MPC, which defines substantial steps as their overt acts very broadly, there were cases that you sometimes wouldn't meet them. But an overt act in conspiracy for most jurisdictions means any act at all that furthers the conspiracy. And it can be completed by any person who's a member of that conspiracy. So it doesn't have, every defendant doesn't have to have their own overt act. So some jurisdictions and some statutes don't have overt act requirements for conspiracy. You know, we will talk about them, but they really are uh, not much of a bar um, because as long as the agreement, you know, predates the arrest, at some point somebody likely has committed even a very minor, minor, minor overt act and furtherance of this. I mean, only if the police descend the moment the agreement occurs, and perhaps they wouldn't in under cover sting, um, they could create a problem if there's no over overt acts yet in furtherance of that agreement by at least one member of the conspiracy. So we focus on agreements. Agreements um, in law, you might think of contracts, you might think of you know that sort of meeting of the minds here. Of course, when we're in the criminal realm, we're not really dealing with detailed documents that show and reflect this meeting of the minds. Uh, agreements are often inferred um, by the evidence. Um, and this is completely permissible. So if two people show up for a bank robbery on the same day, at the same time, uh, even wearing matching ski masks, if you want to add that in, we can infer there was an agreement between them to rob that bank. Even if there's no direct evidence that indicates on such and such a date they met, they agreed to rob that bank. And so this, this inferring of agreements is often a, a part of the, the trial process and the jurors, jury's or fact finder's decision making uh, in deciding if the act requirements are met. They will look at the evidence and they don't have to nail down with specificity when the agreement was made or the exact scope and contours and details, but they do need to find that there is an agreement and they often do that indirectly. Um, sometimes, though, we do have uh, a witness turn state's evidence and, and join the prosecution and talk about the agreement, um, but that's not always the case. So you will have a lot of instances of inferring the agreement. So the agreement has to uh, connect to criminal activity, um, but it's not in itself always obvious that the agreement's criminal, and so I just want to leave that for now. We'll get to that as we look through more examples. Um, but here, the Model Penal Code, which does have an overt act requirement, and the common law, which many jurisdictions have an overt act requirement, but many don't, the actual agreement requirement isn't that different. So we're just going to treat them as the same here. Um, and Mondello is, is an interesting, but maybe slightly atypical case. I like it as a teaching case because it has a lot of, of specific facts about the agreement, and it's not just in this world of inference. And, but it is an unusual case where uh, we have a conviction and the court overturns uh, the conviction by saying there, were ins there was insufficient evidence for an agreement. And I think the dissent might be right that the general outcome here would be to defer to the jury verdict because agreements can be 
inferred and the evidence did support it. And it might be that the majority here is just a little bit more upset about the policing tactics. Regardless of its oddities, it's a nice uh, case because we do have a, a better factual record about the nature of the agreement. And there are some tough issues, right, in deciding what the agreement looks like because we didn't just get two people that say, let's go rob a store tomorrow and, and every, you know, they sign off on an agreement. No, we get some pushback here from our defendant Mondello, and that raises questions because this is an undercover sting uh, by a confidential informant. And that confidential informant clearly wants uh, to get credit for assisting in a bigger crime than what Mondello seems willing to agree to. So let's talk a little bit more about the facts. So this is Parkway Pizza figures prominently since that's the, the business that Mondello and his wife own. This is not that actual Parkway Pizza. There's a surprising number of, of Parkway Pizzas uh, in the country, at least based on my Google image search. So in this case, it seems Mondello um, wants to purchase uh, a reasonable qual quantity of cocaine. Uh, the court was nice enough here to convert the metric system to the English uh, system in ounces, so that might help you a bit more. Students are often flummoxed uh, by the use of grams. Um, but, you know, this is, you know, he's he could be using this entirely for his own. He could be using it with his friend, who's also involved in this case, Jones. Um, or it could be as an attempt to distribute, at least on a small scale, um, the cocaine uh, in uh, either at Parkway Pizza or somewhere else, but they seem to suspect at Parkway Pizza. And so in this case, uh, we have a conviction for the conspiracy um, and then the actual purchase of the cocaine that was made. And the conspiracy charge really is the sticking point because um, the, the confidential informant here and Officer Glick, who is encouraging him, uh, are trying to get Mondello to buy more. And... Um, you know, Mondello, either for financial reasons, perhaps his awareness of the law and the fact that he would be opening himself to greater liability, or just simple need, uh, doesn't want more. Um, and so they go back and forth several times here, right? There, there does seem to be throughout this an agreement to buy cocaine, although there is a moment where Mondello, I think, gets spooked, and, and even the, the officer seems to think that, that he begins to suspect that maybe this is a sting operation because why is there so much pressure being placed to buy more, right? He's, he's like, I can do that in the future. Why, why do it right now? Um, and so one of the reasons this is, this is an interesting thing is, is, is it's hard to know when the jurors thought the agreement was made that would constitute the conspiracy to distribute uh, because there are several conversations. Um, perhaps it would have gone through if Officer Glick had been available on that one day instead of um, not being able to make it there. I mean, there, there does seem, Mondell is at least close to agreeing at several points to this larger quantity, um, but ultimately the amount that is distributed here for, you know, the, the $750 is far less than what uh, Glick and the, under, the informant wanted um, to distribute. And that raises a problem because now we might not have a conspiracy to distribute. We might just have a simple buy, right? And it's not going to be redistributed. It's certainly not obvious uh, from the evidence uh, that was uh, presented. And so, yeah, how do we how do we view this? Well, as I said, we definitely have a good factual record. But when you infer there's an actual agreement, is is there is some variation, right? We know there's an agreement for the small quantity of the cocaine at the end. But if you think there's a prior agreement that's still in place and the parties agree to, to a larger quantity, and this is but the first installment or part of an ongoing uh, distribution, well, then you think there's a conspiracy to distribute, right? In other words, this might just be a down payment of cocaine or a down distribution, a start, uh, and more is coming. Because that, after all, is how uh, drugs are often distributed in batches, right? Maybe not, you know, in bigger batches when we're thinking of bigger dealing. And, and so just because there was a smaller amount distributed in this occasion doesn't preclude the idea that there is a larger conspiracy in play here. On the other hand, we do have evidence uh, from the testimony of our informant that, you know, Mandela's pushed back quite clearly and aggressively at various points by saying, I don't want to do it that fast. I have enough for now. And that seems to imply there was no agreement as to these uh, uh, larger quantities. 
And, you know, it, it seems like the jurors were reasonably instructed. There is a little controversy about how it was put there. And so it is unusual that the court uh, decided to overturn the conspiracy conviction here. Um, and I think it might be uh, simply the case that uh, they weren't happy with the policing tactics, that they seemed to be trying to get Mondello to commit a crime he didn't want to commit. And they just wouldn't take their basic sting operation. Now, you might wonder, well, why, it, why, why didn't they just do the easy sell and just have it over and done with? They actually jeopardized their old sting operation. Well, one reason is both the police and the informant benefit more if this is a big drug bust as opposed to spending all this time and resources. I mean, this takes a long time to get to for a simple sale, right, that, that it, you know, is not really that big a deal in the grand scheme of things. And so it does seem problematic, but not obviously doctrinally problematic uh, for the government to try to create a crime where there isn't one, or at least escalate a crime where there is none. Um, and so that's, I think, ultimately maybe the subtext of the majority opinion here. But I think there's a lot to be said for the dissent, right? We do have an overt act for certain, the, the actual transaction here, and we do have a jury verdict that says they thought there was an agreement, right? They heard the evidence, they heard the witness's testimony, they found it credible enough to say there was an agreement here. And so this is, as I said, a, a, an, an outlier in that the, the appellate court's willing to step in and say there's not an agreement. But I think it has more to do with the fact that we have strong evidence Mondello did say no to various agreements, right? And so then it makes it more difficult to say when was their agreement formed and was it more than this small, smaller purchase at the end. Um, but it shows you, you know, the types of facts you need to look at. And ideally, the, the, this level of detail in the evidence is, is good for the government, right? As opposed to, let's say we just had uh, the final transaction on video and it was, it was recorded um, and we don't have an undercover informant. Well, at that point, you know, alleging a conspiracy beyond the amount distributed would be impossible. I mean, it just, we, we, there would be nothing to offer to the jury. But this confidential informant gives us the extra details because he's trying to get out of his own uh, legal troubles. And so at the end of the day, Mandelo is a good case for looking at the types of facts and how they are integrated into our conspiracy agreement requirement, even if the outcome itself is a bit unusual. That's it for today. Next time I'll move on to mens rea for conspiracy.